All right, hi everybody. This is John Boyle with Seahawks.com. We're gonna try a little NFC West pre-draft round table here. We've got Kiana Martin from the 49ers, Stu Jackson from the Rams, and Mike Jarecki from the Arizona Cardinals. All here to learn a little more about each other's teams heading into the draft, kind of what's happened so far and, and what's gone on so far in free agency and what we might see in the draft. So uh, we'll go ahead and throw it to the defending champs, Kiana. What, what have you seen the 49ers do this off season? You know, what kind of moves are they making? Just fill us in on what, what's happened so far. Yeah, absolutely. Coming off of the year they had, Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch said one thing and one thing only at the combine, and that's that they want to keep this team as together as possible. They did that. Uh, resigning a few guys that were on that 2019 roster, including some guys that might not be those big name guys, but most certainly were a part of the depth, especially on the D line guys like Ronald Blair, um, who was an incredible player, uh, but his season ended short uh, with being on injured reserve. But in addition to him, keeping the depth along the O-line and guys like Ben Garland, um, signing guys like Tom Compton. One of the biggest things that happened this offseason for the 49ers was the trade of DeForest Buckner to the Indianapolis Colts, a veteran, a leader on this roster. But the team feels that with the depth they have, they can keep this thing churning and keep it going into 2020, all while picking up an additional pick in the first round. I was going to ask you that about that trade. Just what, what kind of law, what did Defo bring and how are they going to replace him? Yeah, that's the biggest question. How do you replace a guy like that? Do you seek for someone in the draft? Do you rely on your depth, the guys that you already have there? Uh, 49ers are keeping their cards close to their chest, but I think that's one thing that they really stand on is the depth of that D-line going into the season. That was the position that they felt most comfortable about. Now, of course, as the season progressed, uh, some of those guys ended up having various ailments, but I believe they're going to rely on the guys that they have to step up. Uh, and some of the lesser known guys, guys like DJ Jones, who has been incredible uh, for this team going into his fourth season. So expect to hear some names that you might not hear on the regular stepping up. And Stu, how about the Rams? What have they been up to in this past month or so? Yeah, well, one of the biggest priorities, John, was addressing the offensive line, at least in free agency. They did that by re-signing Andrew Whitworth, team's starting left tackle, and Austin Blythe, who played uh, multiple positions along the interior of the offensive line, eventually took over at center once Brian Allen suffered a, a season-ending injury uh, late in the year. So that, that was a big deal. Uh, they've got some younger guys that can uh, fill in, and, and there's the depth there is a lot better, but that's still a position that you know wouldn't surprise me, honestly, if they – decided to target that in the draft. They also brought in, uh, or agreed to terms, I should say, reportedly with uh, Ashawn Robinson, uh, formerly the Detroit Lions defensive tackle and former Bears outside linebacker, Leonard Floyd. So uh, also shoring up things on defense, finding uh, pieces that fit the new scheme that uh, new defensive coordinator Brandon Staley is going to implement. So a lot of work mainly being done in the trenches. Of course, there was uh, also the news of uh, agreeing to terms on a trade with the Houston Texans, uh, sending Brandon Cooks over for second round pick, and then uh, releasing Todd Gurley, of course, was also big news. So uh, maybe those are positions they also end up targeting in the draft as well. We'll see, but uh, a, lot, a lot going on on both sides of the ball here as, as we uh, approach the NFL draft this year. All right, and Mike, we know uh, we know there's one big trade involving the Cardinals, and uh, tell us a little more about that and everything else they've been up to for the last month. Well, you know, this is the first time the Cardinals have some stability with the head coach and obviously the quarterback and the general manager, and, you know, obviously they're going to try to protect Kyler Murray. So initially they retained Larry Fitzgerald. He goes into his 16th season. Still productive, great locker room guy, great in the community. I'm convinced then, he'll never retire. Yeah, I mean, he's he's not chasing Jerry Rice. I, I think now it's all he has to do, left is probably be a first ballot Hall of Famer. But anyways, re-signed DJ Humphreys, 26 years old, obviously probably one of the top 16, 17 tackles in football, and then put the transition tag on Kenyon Drake. He played very well. Obviously, they traded David Johnson, uh, for, uh, got rid of his entire salary, which is remarkable. And then obviously give up a two and a four for DeAndre Hopkins. Hopkins will come in here and be the number one wide receiver. Cardinals really didn't have a number one wide receiver on the roster the last few seasons. They drafted three last year in, in the 2019 draft. Andy Isabella, Keyshawn Johnson, and Akeem Butler, they did absolutely nothing. 
So I thought going in with the eighth overall pick, they may consider one of these top receivers. But I think um, right now with Hopkins, he's going to be a guy they're going to be targeted, open things up for Kyler Murray. So the offensive line is still an issue, even though they averaged 5.2 yards a carry last year. They were 21 in rush offense and then 27th in pass protection. So even though they give up 48 sacks, I'll put half of those on Murray, too many negative plays. They ran a lot of four wide to start off the season 0-3 and 1. So for the most part, I still think they want to address the offensive line or defensive line. They went out and signed Jordan Phillips from the Bills, D-tackle for, uh, you know, maybe a four-year deal. Yes, it was. And then Derek Kennard, who was let go by the Lions, played with the Giants, a local kid. Uh, his father played for the Cardinals. And then they signed uh, Devontae uh, Campbell, uh, who's going to be their tight end guy, who's going to cover down the field. So, you know, basically you get Patrick Peterson back and Robert Alford, uh, Byron Murphy, and keeping advanced shows, I think, was important. You don't want to have four coordinators in four different years. All right, thank you. And I'll uh, do a quick recap on the Seahawks as well. They've got an early start adding Greg Olson when he became available in February. And then as they usually do, they took it a little slow early in free agency. Uh, then started adding you know, a lot of offensive linemen. They brought in four got, or I'm sorry, three o- o- offensive linemen so far from other teams. Um, you know, the big question mark right now, obviously, is going to be what happens with Jadavian Clowney. That's kind of everybody around the league is wondering that. And, uh, you know, if he's – the pass rush was an issue last year. If he's retained, they feel better about it. They've made some other moves to address it. If not, I think that'll be the, the big question mark heading into the draft. And, you know, at this point, we may not know what's going on with Clowney by draft time. So that's probably going to be a big focus regardless. Before we get into kind of specific draft needs, I want to follow up on a couple things. Mike, you mentioned the stability – You've got Kyler Murray, obviously, another year with the same coaching staff. Then you go in and add one of the best receivers in the NFL. Just what's the level of excitement about this team, kind of what it can do in its second year with this group? Well, I mean, to me, you know, let's be honest. They've won eight games the last couple of years. They fired Steve Wilkes after one year. They bring in Kingsbury and out of the box hired. Didn't have a winning record in college. But obviously, you know, the Kingsbury and Murray knew the offense. They went back and looked at Texas Tech film and, you know, when you look at uh, Oklahoma film. So it just now they just can focus on getting better, but you got to get it right. And obviously the Cardinals had a little, a little cap space, and I think they're in a good spot. Now they don't have a second-round pick, so it, it's possible they could try to trade down there. But, you know, overall it's just they got to add some more talent. You know, they got some five-star players, but you got to have some depth. And I think Steve kind of figuring that out. And I think this process they're going through, it's going to go back to his – early days when he was a scout and that's where he cut his teeth. And and I think he's watching a lot more film because, you know, obviously the Cardinals haven't hit home runs in the first picks over the last few years besides Kyler Murray. Stu, uh, the Rams, obviously you referenced some of this, but some, some big names have have, they've had to move on for other various reasons. Just what's going to be kind of the key for the Rams to get back to where they want to be after just falling short of the playoffs last year. Yeah. The biggest thing I think to me is the offensive line. Uh, just because that's what, you know, made the difference the season when they uh, went to the Super Bowl, just the protection and the time that Jared Goff had um, just due to injuries and and things like that this past season, uh, which he did not have. So if they can get the offensive line back to the form it was in 2018, I think that'll go a long way. Um, But you also have to look at on defense too, um, also releasing Clay Matthews, Corey Littleton signing with the Raiders. And, of course, uh, starting slot cornerback, Nikel Roby Coleman, uh, signing with the Eagles. There's some starters on defense that you're also going to have to replace, too, not to mention Dante Fowler. That's an, another name. So uh, there, are, there are needs that definitely still need to be addressed. But I think, kind of like I mentioned with what was prioritized, at least initially in free agency, it's going to start with making sure that offensive line plays at the caliber that it did a couple years ago. And then, Kiana, I remember when I was covering the Seahawks in 2015, they, they got off to a little bit of a slow start. Everyone's talking Super Bowl hangover. That's It's a hard thing from teams to come back from. The 49ers, you know, they as you said, they've retained a lot of their talent. They've got a good young quarterback, great head coach. How is that even a topic of discussion right now, kind of not avoid or trying to avoid that so-called hangover, or do they just feel like it's all in the past? 
I feel like that's that storyline is following every Super Bowl. Every team yeah. that is on the opposite side. You hear about this Super Bowl hangover, and the question is, is this a real thing? It's only been done, I believe, maybe three times in NFL history. The guys know that. They hear it, and I feel like anytime anyone is doing an interview, that's the number one question that they're asked. Is it possible for this team to make it back to the big game? And me being not biased, I think it's completely possible. You got to look at the roster that this team has and their ability to try to re retain as many players as they possibly can. Um, so that's the focus of this team. They know it, they hear it. Uh, but I believe they're pretty good at shutting out the noise just as they shut it out when they were four and 12 and no one believed a four and 12 team could make it to the Super Bowl. Hey, John, let me ask you about Clowney. Yes. Is, it, is it asking price or do you, is there any, uh, obviously, injuries have popped up what do you what do you think this is the big picture that they're looking at yeah i mean obviously in free agency anytime something's not getting done money's going to be at the root of the issue i would imagine you know just looking from the outside that his health history and what's going on in the world right now is an issue that mm -hmm. he can't go take physicals with other teams right now and he's a guy that is coming off that core muscle injury that required surgery. So there might be some teams waiting, you know, that, that like him, but they want to be able to get their own doctors to look at him. So at this point, as long as it's gone, I, I don't know that it's going to happen anytime soon. You know, I've, I've got no inside info on that, but just I would think if it's, he's allowed it to go this long, it shows he's willing to be patient and wait for the right deal. So we'll kind of have to wait and see what happens. Obviously the Seahawks would love to have him back. I mean, when he was healthy last year, uh, Kiana got to see him at his best in that game down in San Francisco. Oh, yeah. so he, he can be a game wrecker when he's good. So Seahawks are hoping to get it done, but they unfortunately haven't been able to figure out the details yet. And I think Jared Reed, I mean, obviously by him re-signing there, yeah. what, what does that do to the D-line? Because, you know, the Cardinals have gone with battles back and forth every year. Yeah, I mean, that's big for them because they have a lot of free agents on that defensive line. Quentin Jefferson, the guy who started a bunch of games for them, he left in free agency. We obviously talked about Clowney. Um, they've got some other guys whose future is unknown. So keeping Reed around, that's a pretty big get. He's coming off, you know, what for him was a little bit of a disappointing year. He had that 10 and a half sack season in 2018 then had the four game suspension and never really got going. So they're looking for him to, to bounce back and kind of repeat what he was two years ago. So that, that was a big move to retain him. I want to ask Keanu, when they were four and 12, obviously you lose Jimmy Garoppolo, but that roster was much more talented. So I think people are, are misled when you say a four and 12 team, you know, teams can go worse to first and we've seen it happen, but obviously when you lose your starting quarterback and what was it, uh, Beathard and Mullins were playing, but in, inside, do you think they thought if the, Jimmy would have stayed healthy, they could have made a run? Absolutely. Uh, one thing that they say, I mean, if you look right now, a lot of the, high, the headlines are, is Jimmy Garoppolo really that guy? And this team has so much faith in him, what he's brought to this team, what he's brought to this locker room, what he brings to the huddle. A lot of these guys feel like if Jimmy Garoppolo stayed healthy, that was one of the missing pieces that caused this team to fall to four and 12. They had the potential, they had some guys there. They were missing some key pieces. I mean, we can throw out guys names like Nick Bosa or a D Ford. They were missing a couple of key pieces, but I do believe that Jimmy Garoppolo, him not physically being out there on the field did play a lot in their success or lack of in 2018. Hey Stu, I got a question for you, Les Snead. I mean, obviously they put all their chips in to try to make a run and they got very close and you know, maybe the Super Bowl hangover, but, you know, if seven teams make the playoffs last year, the Rams get in. How has Snead handled the cap situation considering the circumstances? Yeah, he's he's handled it, um, you know, reasonably well, just trying to find some uh, free agents, like I mentioned earlier, that fit the fit the team's budget and, and fit what they're trying to do defensively. And also, again, what makes sense for uh, the offensive line with bringing guys like Andrew Whitworth and, and Austin Blythe back. Uh, there were rumors about, you know, maybe Jared Goff, uh, team starting quarterback, obviously uh, restructuring his, his uh, contract potentially. Uh, so far, there's been nothing official on that end. He did say on a video conference today that he was open to doing that. So at this stage, they, they still should have uh, enough space if, if they have um, other needs to address, but, uh, as of, as of right now, thing, things are looking like they're, they're going to be in good shape, at least for, for the time being. Well, if nobody has more for each other, we could kind of – let's talk 
draft specifically. Uh, maybe remind everybody what kind of draft ammunition your team has. And then, you know, we don't need to predict names unless you feel like it, but just sort of position groups, things that could make sense. So uh, we'll go back to Kiana for that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, before the trade went down, 49ers only had six picks in the draft, picking up now that 13th overall pick. Now they have seven. Uh, despite having two picks in the first round, no picks on day two at all. Uh, that's usually where their money picks are of recent years uh, when you're looking at some of the names that they got. So I wouldn't be surprised if you do see some trades go down uh, next week during uh, draft week. But as of right now, uh, 49ers with seven picks. Uh, draft needs, I mean, losing Emmanuel Sanders in free agency wide receiver is something where the 49ers could look to. I'm not saying they might do that with 13 or 31, but it is a very deep wide receiver draft. So getting some of those names who might be in the back half uh, of the first round and maybe day two. Uh, also with the loss of DeForest Buckner, do they choose to go that route and seek some of those names uh, in the first round? I know Ken Law's there. Uh, a lot of people are making that connection uh, with the 49ers. Not sure how they feel about that. Might just stick with what they have. And also uh, one name that hasn't been brought up is actually the future of Joe Staley now entering into his 14th NFL season. Uh, is he going to hang up the cleats? We're not sure. Uh, he's from what we've last heard and from what John Lynch revealed at the combine, he's planning on playing this next year, uh, but anything can happen. So I believe that they would like to find his future replacement at some point in this draft. How about you, Stu? What are the Rams looking at? I know they are maybe missing a few picks, but what, what's going on in the draft for them? Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest thing with the Rams is, at least with Snead, his strategy has been, as they've traded away these first-round picks, to still acquire as many uh, top 100 selections as possible. They've got uh, number 52 overall and number 57 because of the Brandon Cooks trade with the Texans. And then, of course, 84, and then just outside the top 100, number 104 overall from the compensatory formula. So that'll give them uh, some capital to work with to try to address those needs. They've been able to find starters with that kind of capital before. So, uh, you know, you could probably, you may be looking at potentially trying to find uh, Andrew Whitworth's eventual successor at, at the left tackle spot. Um, Snead has said before that. Joe Nopum, who, who they uh, took out of TCU, uh, he redshirted his rookie year and then started a left guard last year before suffering a season-ending injury. He's been viewed as somebody who could potentially be that guy or maybe Bobby Evans, who was uh, one of their picks last year. They could also add another candidate into that pool by potentially taking someone in, in this year's draft. So that's probably on the Rams' minds as well as uh, finding an edge rusher, somebody who can, who can – uh, take advantage of those Aaron Donald double teams on the defensive line and, and get some pressure on the quarterback, especially with, like I mentioned before, losing a guy like Dante Fowler. And of course, you know, depending on what they're doing at, at cornerback, that may be a position where they'd want to shore up the depth safety as well with uh, Marquis Christian departing and, and Eric Weddle retiring. So uh, there, there's needs that uh, I think reasonably could be addressed with those uh, first four picks, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how they prioritize that. And then, Mike, how about the Cardinals? Um, they only have six draft picks. Obviously, you give up a two and a four for DeAndre Hopkins. I think they would do that all day. Um, they have the eighth overall pick. I think they would address the offensive tackle, whether it's Willis or worse. And then if you go defense, I think they really like Derek Brown or Javon Kinlaw. Now, if they trade down, I think Steve would like to trade down. Not too far, though. Because you could see a run with the Niners possibly or some other built the Bills with wide receivers. But if they do trade down, I think wide receiver is still a consideration. But I don't think at number eight, I think they want to improve the offensive tackle or the defensive line. And then their next pick won't be to number 72. So that's why I think, you know, they want to acquire more picks, more bites at the apple. So that's something we're going to have to look for. But if Brown or one of those two tackles, which I assume somebody's going to be there at number eight, you're going to have a tough decision. All right. And then for, for the Seahawks, it's a uh, first round pick is 27 overall, although no Seahawks fan expects them to use that. They last used their original first round pick in 2011. They've wow. traded, traded back or traded that pick for a player every year since then. So we'll see what happens there. They've got an extra second with the Frank Clark trade last year to the Chiefs, um, seven total picks. So 
Last year, John Shire managed to turn four picks into 11. So I, I would think that we're going to see the Seahawks make a bunch of picks. But uh, need-wise, I mentioned this earlier, I would think defensive line, pass rush. You can't obviously know what's going to happen with Clowney going into the draft at this point. They, they got to kind of prepare for if they don't have him. So I think we're going to see them address the pass rush. They've signed a bunch of offensive linemen, but a lot of veteran guys, maybe they want to get some young competition in there. And as you guys both mentioned, you know, maybe some long-term replacements for veteran guys as well. So uh, a lot of areas they could go, but uh, yeah, I'm sure that the big thing will probably be trades because that's how it always is covering the Seahawks. They still able to work on the stadium? So as far as I know, it's, it's considered in a, construction still considered an essential business and mm -hmm. they're taking measures to have people social distance and mm -hmm. get their temperatures taken going in to work and wearing masks, things like that. But um, yeah, I think at least as of right now, probably the only thing that would be in jeopardy is uh, the Taylor Swift concert. That's like the first event in late July. That's assuming the stadium opens on time. Mm -hmm that's going to take place there so all right everybody well i think that we've covered it all unless somebody has other things they want to throw out but uh otherwise no i i appreciate you putting this together and uh look forward to seeing it everyone's excited about the draft thank you yeah let's uh maybe revisit it after the draft we can talk about what actually happened thanks again uh, everybody for jumping on let's do it all right thanks have john appreciate it thank you john